I want to thank Lambert for singing that. I asked, that was a request from the pastor, the Via Dolorosa, the way of suffering. We've been talking the last few weeks about following Jesus and what it means in our lives. And today we get to the point of following him to suffer. So I'm reading to you from John chapter 12. This is after Jesus has entered Jerusalem. We're taking things a little bit of chronological out of order for the next few weeks. But this is beginning at verse 20 of the 12th chapter of John. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it. Those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I want to tell you a story this morning about St. Francis. Not St. Francis of Assisi, St. Francis of Hedgesville, West Virginia, where I served two parishes ago. Francis was in his probably mid to late 50s at the time, when he was a boy, he had suffered a head injury and some sort of traumatic accident. I was never quite sure what it was because he couldn't explain it to me because of the level of uh, cognitive impairment he had after that. But I know he was bullied terribly because other people who had grown up with him said he was always beaten up at the bus stop or on the bus. And Francis grew and he worked in the Acres Plastic Factory. He worked 12-hour shifts and it was about six miles from where he lived and he walked both ways every day. Now, he lived in a rental trailer that had no running water. And I would be driving down the road someday, and I would pick him up and take him. And I knew it was very difficult to take Francis, because if you have no running water, you can't bathe. And if you work in a plastic factory, the smell could be overwhelming. To the point that sometimes I would be with a parishioner of mine, and I'd say, there's Francis, we need to pick him up. And the person said, I cannot stand the smell of him. And I was rolled my window down. When we, no matter if it was January, I'd have the window down a little bit. But Francis was an unusual guy. And there was a crop walk in Martinsburg, West Virginia. I don't know if you're familiar with crop. Church World Service, the hunger organization. Youth groups would go and they would get sponsors to march and they'd collect money. Now, when I started out, it was a 10-mile walk. Now, we don't do 10 miles anymore, we do 10 kilometers, because it sounds big, but it's only 6.2 miles. And the youth group signed up, and they had sponsors, and we went, only to see Francis standing there waiting for us. Now, they wanted people to understand what it's like for people who have to walk a long way to get food, and especially in Africa, where they have to walk such a long way to get water. So they filled gallon jugs with water for kids to carry, and the kids were like, oh, I'm going to carry them. The boys would start out with two, ho, 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 ho. They made it about 50 yards down the road, and they're like, I can't carry this, Pastor Jerry. This is just too heavy. I look, and there's Francis carrying two gallons of water. Two gallons of water, you know what that weighs? About 16 and a half pounds. And I said to him, Francis, why in the world are you doing this on your day off? You who walk everywhere you have to go, and you who have to carry water from a well in the yard into the house just to cook with. And he said to me something that shamed me, because I was sort of fussing at him, like, Francis, why would you do this on your day off? Because I was trying to help take care of him. And he looked at me and he said, I know what it's like to be hungry. I know what it's like to go without water. Talk about humbling your pastor. That really got me to the core. So what does that have to do with all this suffering that we're talking about? What Toby read from the Old Testament, from Isaiah, is the suffering servant song. Now, there are different interpretations of who the suffering servant is. Some biblical scholars believe that the writer of Isaiah, God speaking through him, was talking about Israel at the time of the exile, when they were taken out of their land and they lived very deprived lives, especially when they returned to see Jerusalem just about destroyed and they had to rebuild. But they suffered. But obviously, when we've got to the first Peter reading, the second chapter, is the interpretation that most Christians have today that what they were talking about was Jesus who would come. Jesus who was hanging on the cross and by his wounds, or if you were like me and you grew up with the King James Version, by his stripes we are healed. 
I remember being a kid thinking, is Jesus like a zebra or what? Stripes, meaning those bruises from being beaten, being scourged by those we are healed because when he went to the cross and died there for our sake, we know he was raised and that is what saves us. But in 1 Peter, it says, for to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you should follow in his steps. The Via Dolorosa, the way of suffering, that's what we're called to walk sometimes. I left out the beginning of this passage because it has been so misinterpreted through the years. For to this you've been called, you've been called to suffer in the name of Jesus Christ. And in this very specific setting, what was the suffering that they were called to endure? He was talking to slaves, those who were enslaved. He said, if you're a slave, don't, don't rise up against your masters. Even if they beat you, don't return evil for evil, but return good for evil. I always hesitate to read that part because of how that passage has been interpreted through the years even in our own nation, by Christian people who said this is God's desire that people remain enslaved. This was often quoted in the days of the American slave trade as justification for enslaving other human beings. It's not at all what this is about. This is about those people who are suffering for Christ. If you look at the time that this was written, you'll know that it, Christianity was a very small sect within Judaism. They didn't have enough people to rise up against anything. And what they were being called to do, because it wasn't typically Jewish families who owned slaves, was it? Who owned the slaves in that time? The Romans. And the head of the household would make offering to the Roman gods, and everyone in the household, wives, children, slaves, would be expected to participate. They couldn't do that because they belonged to Jesus Christ. They said, we cannot worship these gods, and they knew that if they said no, that they would subject themselves to beatings, torture, and even death. That's what we're talking about here. That's what the writer of 1 Peter is saying to them. You have to take a stand, even if it means you suffer. But it was never intended to be used for a Christian to say to someone else, put up with what you've got, because that is what God has intended for you. Just this week, I was very troubled when I read a Christian article online saying that Vladimir Putin is doing the work of Jesus Christ in Ukraine. You look shocked, some of you. Oh, it's out there. The reason that they gave is because he's taking a stand against the Western liberal church, especially when it comes to homosexuality and transgender, which, you know, gets punishable by imprisonment and possibly by death in Russia under Vladimir Putin. They said he is doing God's work. Anyone who believes that God's work includes bombing a maternity hospital or places where children are hiding in fear of their lives, if you want to attribute that to Jesus Christ, come and see me because we need to talk. But Jesus says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Glorified. What does glorified mean? Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it. Those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Which means that we're going to suffer. I thought about titling this sermon, Buckle Up, It's Going to Be a Bumpy Ride. Because is life that easy? Tell me, is life easy? We suffer, don't we, in this world? One of the reasons I don't have my robe on this morning, and I like wearing it, especially in my vestments during holy seasons like Lent and Advent, and whenever we serve communion or celebrate communion or celebrate a baptism, I always wear my vestments. I couldn't get it on today because my shoulder hurts so much. And I smell like Ben Gay because I have a patch on up here, and it's a little bit crazy. I have the brace on my knee this morning, and I'm walking with my cane until I get my new knee and then later hopefully a new shoulder. Sometimes we suffer, don't we? Sometimes we suffer in our minds as well as our bodies. People are really struggling against what happened with the pandemic. People have lost heart. People are depressed. People are worn down by life right now. And that can wear on your spirit as well. So we all have suffering that we do. But we don't suffer for the fate of the world. That was Jesus. But we know that when we follow him, sometimes it's going to bring about some sort of suffering. 
I will tell you again what I always say. The church in the United States is not being persecuted. I, whenever I see that, I laugh. The church is not being persecuted. We get our toes stepped on sometimes by people who don't believe what we believe. We are not, by any stretch of the word, persecuted for our faith. But I look then to Henry Nouwen. Some of you may have heard of him. He was a Dutch priest, a Catholic priest, and I was able to go and see him one time when he was alive. He came to Johns Hopkins Medical School and he had 800 pastors and priests chanting in Latin. It's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen because the Baptists were like, chant Latin, are you crazy? But we started, ubi caritas at amor, ubi caritas deus ibs, where charity and love are found, there God is. And the most beautiful sound I've ever heard came up from all these pastors together. He had that sort of charisma. He could talk and you would listen to him. He wrote a book that is foundational for my faith called The Wounded Healer. It came out in 1972. I was in junior high in 1972. It came out then, and it's still something that I go to again and again and again. What he says in his book, the great illusion of leadership is to think that man can be led out of the desert by someone who has never been there. Our lives are filled with examples which tell us that leadership asks for understanding, that understanding requires sharing. Let me make that a little bit more inclusive. The great illusion of discipleship is to think that one can be led out of the desert by someone who has never been there. This is why 12-step programs work. Because when you go to a 12-step program, you go when you're broken, you go when you're at your worst, you go in addicted, you go in expecting the same judgment you're gonna get everywhere else, and you know what you find? You find open arms welcoming you. You find people who have been there and who know how to get out. And if you slide, if you backslide, if you slip back into your bad behavior, they're gonna love you right on out of it again. They will never give up on you. I've told the story before about Rowena, the woman who came to my congregation when her husband died. She was already 80 years old. She moved from New Jersey, stood up during the joys and concerns and held up her chip and said, this is my 40 year sober chip from AA. Nobody knew she had been an alcoholic in her life she was not ashamed to say that and gave glory to God who saved her. And then I remembered another man who once wrote to me and said, I so wanted to get up Sunday in church and celebrate the 25th anniversary of my sobriety, but I knew people would judge me if I did because no one here knew what I had been before I came to Christ. The great illusion of discipleship is to think that one can be led out of the desert by someone who has never been there. Jesus went to the desert for our sake. He went to the cross for our sake. He went to the tomb for our sake. He was raised for our sake. And when we suffer, we don't suffer alone. I think I've told you before that I used to have this little poster in my room and I lost it through the years that said that Joy is not the absence of suffering, it is the presence of Christ in the midst of suffering. I truly believe that. Which is why I was so proud when Paul a few weeks ago stood up and talked about being sober for a year, and y'all cheered for him. Because if we cannot share our vulnerabilities, we will never be able to lead anyone to what we have found in God. I remember when my husband was diagnosed with his fatal condition, and I got up and preached, and one Sunday in church he had one of his episodes. He stood up as I was getting ready to preach and he said, I can't do this anymore, I can't do this anymore, I can't do this anymore. His tremors would be so bad he looked like he was having a seizure. I went back to make sure it wasn't his heart, it was his neurological condition and two men from the congregation took him home, one being our next door neighbor who was a member of the church and a great friend of mine, still to this day. Took him home and people were a little fussy with me saying you should have gone with him and I said, this is our life now, we have to do this. I was a little depressed until a woman came to me later and she said, I want to be baptized. I said, why now? And she said, I want what you have. I want what you have. I want that faith. I want to know that when things are really bad in my life that I have someone to turn to and someplace to go. I want to know Christ the way you know Christ and I baptized her. People are not attracted by the things we do well. They're attracted by people who understand their pain understand their struggles and their suffering and their strife. So if you have suffered because you've grieved, reach out to someone who is grieving. If you are a cancer survivor, reach out to someone with cancer who needs to know that there is possible healing and there's hope on the other side. 
If you've been addicted yourself, reach out to someone who's struggling against addiction and share with them the good news of a Savior who came for your sake, who died for your sake, who was raised for your sake, who lives for your sake. Go out into the world in the name of Jesus Christ and kiss somebody's boo-boo. Offer them healing. Offer them hope. Offer them your vulnerability. And you will lead people from the desert that you were in yourself. Some of you probably didn't know the first hymn, How Can I Keep From Singing? How many of you knew that one? It's an old one. It's not an old one that everybody knows, but it's an old one. I want to read a little bit of it to you again. I hear the real, though far off hymn that hails a new creation. Sometimes it feels very far off, doesn't it? Salvation in Christ. Sometimes it feels like the pandemic is just going to keep coming back and back and back. No storm can shake my inmost calm while to that rock I'm clinging. Since love is Lord of heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? What though my joy and comforts die, I know my Savior liveth. What though the darkness gather round, songs in the night he giveth. The peace of Christ makes fresh my heart, a fountain ever springing. All things are mine since I am his. How can I keep from singing? Go into the world singing. Go into the world to take the compassion of Christ with you. Be his hands, his feet, his heart. Be where he cannot be unless he is there in you so that others might know the truth of our faith and turn to him. For our Savior Jesus Christ, amen, amen, amen.